Hi, it was a pretty interesting day on uh, counting day for us and this is going to be a talk partly about our experiences on that day but more importantly on how we scaled the election visualizations to serve the entire country. Those of you who saw CNN IBN's TV coverage, the CNN IBN website or the Bing election website, that was the visualization that we created and that's what I'm going to be talking about. Um, <laughs> The whole thing started during I mean, at the time when the elections were just about getting kicked off. We uh, had this large screen that Microsoft had put together. Uh, they'd taken it to the CNIBN NOIDA office and uh, we had this installed somewhere in their office. Yeah, so that's kind of what it looked like. The uh, studio was behind and we just had this large screen with our software running on it. it it's a touch screen. It's a huge one. It's beautiful when you start playing around with it. So Bhupen Chobe in his introductory broadcast starts going to the screen, touching things, showing what the election is like. This is the history of all of the parliament elections so far. This is These are the parties that have been winning. These are the parties that have been losing, drilling down to the next level. Who are the candidates that are winning? In which regions are they winning? And so on. And while all this is happening, you might see one bearded character with a red t-shirt in the background. So that's me. My first appearance on live television, um, <laughs> a hack of various kinds. And what I was doing there was very urgently calling home and colleagues saying, look, turn on CNN IB and watch me on TV. <laughs> so, uh, now this was the time when the elections were starting. There, were, there was almost a month of people going around doing the polls and so on. Um, and in this process, we found a number of interesting things. So one of the things that we discovered just by playing around with the data was that there are some constituencies where the elections have had a fairly interesting history. To take an example, if I were to take the election history of uh, if I were to take the election history of Tamil Nadu as a state, okay, this is the assembly election history. Each of these circles represents one constituency. The size of the circle represents the number of candidates that stood for election and the color represents the party that won. So there were totally about 700 odd candidates that stood for election and in this particular constituency, which is Perambalu, there were as many as 10 candidates. The next year, about the same number of candidates, a few new constituencies popped in. In 1977, you see two things. Firstly, there's a sudden increase in the number of candidates, almost doubling from 700 odd to almost 1400. And there's also a shift in the party results. DMK in yellow, which was winning until then, now has given way to ADMK, which is the largest party. And this goes on. But the thing is, look at this constituency. In Madurandagam, we have as many as 90 people contesting in one election. That's quite a bit. I mean, how am I going to read through a list of 90 names and figure out which is the right candidate to vote for, right? Um, 1989, this problem seems to be all over the place. But in 1991, we have two constituencies, Pallipet with 264 candidates and Avarakuruchi with 249 candidates. Now, you don't have a ballot paper, you have a ballot booklet, which you flip through and say, oh, where am I? You know, is this the right place for me to be in? But all of this pales in comparison to the 1996 elections where Madakuruchi had 1,033 candidates. Now, if you start looking at the names of some of these candidates, right, I mean, uh, so uh, when we examined the actual list of candidates that came in, uh, there were about 40 odd Parnisami Ks. So, there's a Parnisami K, Parnisami K, Parnisami K, Parnisami K. I mean, how do you even figure out which Parnisami K you are if you were going to vote? And which is, in fact, what happened because what we found was that the total, uh, if I were to put in the list of candidates out here. So those are all the Parnisami A's, the B's, the C's, the D's. And you realize at this point, this is no longer a booklet. This is a telephone directory that you're effectively giving as a ballot paper saying, pick the guy you want to vote for. And looks like 88 of them couldn't find their names because they got zero votes. They didn't vote for themselves. Their friends and family didn't vote for themselves. <laughs> so now, obviously, there's a lot more fun in the bottom, right? I mean, where there are zero votes and stuff like that. The news is in the top, but the fun is at the bottom. Another case that we found was that there was this party, which you probably never heard of, called the Doordarshi Party. Okay, now this is a remarkable party in the sense that it has contested in more elections than most parties. In 1984, they, they formed in 1980, uh, 80, I think. And in 1984, when they contested for the first time, they participated in all of the areas indicated in black. That's odd vote. 90 odd constituencies and they won in exactly zero constituencies. Just fine, I mean, it's a large party, but it's still one in zero. They would have given up, but they didn't. 
in 1989 they contested in 298 seats okay at this point they're the second largest party only congress has had more seats than the gdp and they won in exactly zero seats they did not give up in the 1991 elections they contested again this time with an expanded coverage of 321 constituencies okay bringing the total number of seats ever contested to 700 plus zero wins not only zero wins they were never even the runner up in any of the con constituencies that they contested in at best they were third and that was only in the places where there were only three candidates so very persistent now one could go on to the details of how this happened why this happened etc but i'm going to fast forward to the actual counting day because what happened there is a lot more interesting and relevant to the scaling discussion that we are about to have see um, that was rajdeep sir they say walking in the evening of the previous day saying Look, we have to get this up and running got to get this ready uh, <laughs> the plan was that nobody was going to go home that night he would apparently walk in the next day at around 5:30 so everything's about to be ready for them so all the staff were out there all the reporters were out there and we were all busy trying to get this set up and the key thing was that we were expecting to cross over 5 million visitors the next day it was going to be one of the largest media events that had ever been covered so how do we get this to scale now the thing was this bit about 5 million visitors i got to know uh, approximately at around 3 pm the previous day so it certainly helps now <laughs> it's warning at least it doesn't come out of the blue so it was a last minute half day scramble to try and see if we can get this rather sophisticated visualization working for counting day for this many users this was the design of the visualization uh, you can check this on a variety of websites including hybian.grana.com if my connection is good enough we okay my connection is not there so doesn't matter i'll walk you talk you through this you get to see who are the parties that are leading in the nda in the upa and uh, uh all the others you get to see where they won in the map either as a map view or as an alliance view i mean the party view or an alliance view and you can see the whole thing as a list plus there are a whole bunch of filters you want if you want to see where the congress won where they lost the last time or where they've taken over the bjp or vice versa who won in the muslim constituencies who won in the sc constituencies who won in x y and z all of that is available as filter so there's a fair bit of dynamism and interactivity that's going on here so it's not a simple visualization to render so uh, question is how do we get this and this is complicated by the fact that there are multiple devices we are rendering it on the web we are rendering it on television we are rendering it on mobile and uh, since we were doing it on television for the first time it gave us a whole lot of headaches for example this is the actual visualization that you saw on television you notice that it's brownish green this is what actually looks like white on tv on the screen the, and proper white looks like fluorescent green in fact i got very confused on the very, on the first day that i came because uh, vinay talwar whom you see here right on the first day he had come after a session on uh, camera and he looked like he does on tv fair and all of that the next day i saw somebody who i i could swear was his brother much darker uh, completely different looking so i said okay fine looks familiar but i don't quite know this is until he walks over and says hey anand how are you good you vinay now the amount of makeup that you have to put on to look like what you look like on tv is terrible on men it kind of looks okay on the women it looks ghastly face to face okay you, you stay away from them for a minute okay fine what is this white face that you got in your you haven't removed your makeup or what so we had to make all kinds of color correction so they took the camera in there showed it to us as to what it looked like in camera and what it looked like on screen we dynamically uh, so that's me on the bottom right looking very carefully at what it looks like on the screen turning around to see what it looks like on camera and then trying to sort that out so having done all of that what we did was put together the following architecture the data comes from nielsen which has the data updated directly from the election commission very rapidly and that is updated on a cnn ibn server it's a microsoft sql server they've got into which all of the data gets pumped in and we then had this windows uh, xp laptop really ancient system that is sitting in a very very cold data center and we installed a bunch of scripts there that would take data from the sql server every 10 seconds break it up into a variety of ways do certain amount of processing which i will describe and then send this data onto a server in singapore which is an azure ubuntu server uh, in which we had installed the gramna visualization server that's a proprietary software that i'm not going to be talking about that's what create takes all of these templates and renders them and finally put this onto an nginx front end 
uh, proxying system that would serve it to the end users. What I'm going to be doing for the rest of the session is work backwards and talk about how we scale each of these systems. Let's start with Nginx. Firstly, why Nginx? That's an easy one. It's the server that scales up the most uh, <laughs> compared to say uh, Light TPD or uh, Light T or Apache. It does an order of magnitude more requests almost. So that's a pretty easy one. Uh, but the question is how exactly do you go about configuring it so that it's op optimized? Now, <clears throat> one of the things that we did was make sure that it's load balanced. So we split the load across four servers. We had installed four instances of our backend web server and Nginx, whenever it gets a request, randomly sends it to one or the other. And this also comes with a bit of uh, fail safe uh, command. So in case there's an error, we just send it to the next upstream. So in case at any point any one of these servers gets overwhelmed, well, it just goes to the next server, goes to the next server and so on. Uh, the other thing that we did was make sure that it's cached. You don't want the application server to be constantly hit with requests that it need not have generated, especially if the content is not going to be dynamic. So at least the static part of the content and the content that does not change whenever a request is refreshed is going to be cached for a reasonably long period, again with fallbacks. Now this is reasonably straightforward stuff. You can read about this in the Nginx wiki. The other thing that we did though was to explicitly create aliases for static files. See the normal process by which a default application server is configured is it's got a way of taking static files and sending it to the front-end proxy and it has a way of generating dynamic files. Most people don't change the setting. What we found was that about 95% of the requests that were coming in were for the static files. Not that it was a problem and we didn't think it was a problem until 3 p.m. the previous day when they told look 5 million visitors are going to be visiting. So we said okay in that case the application server is doing nothing more than taking the files and sending it to Nginx. Why not let Nginx do that? So we made this last minute tweak to say all of these files which are just plain static take it directly from their actual locations. The next bit was having tweaked the front end a little bit was to try and reduce the payload. You obviously want to have as little content delivered to the client mainly because this slow bandwidth, I mean, this was to have been a mobile application, this was a mobile application as well. So on a mobile broadband connection, at best, you get 100 uh, uh, kilobytes per second. And on a normal mobile connection, you get as little as 10 kilobytes per second. So how does one go about compressing that content? Now, one obvious thing is to do is to gzip the content. I guess almost all of you would do that. In our case, it brought the payload of about 1.5 MB down to about 380 kilobytes, which is a, a almost a factor of four compression, which meant that on a relatively slow connection, which is what I was doing this benchmarking on, it would get served in a little over three seconds. Now, three seconds is not ideal, but we didn't really have that much time to get it less than that. So, and it was okay. So we left it at that. Uh, now, what we did though, however, was to tweak the level of gzip compression. Nginx by default sets a gzip compression level of one or two, depending on the version which means that it doesn't try too hard to compress. Now, why is that? Because the aim is to make this as fast as possible. But in our case, the compression has enormous value and a lot of the content is cached anyway. So we didn't really have a problem by increasing the level of uh, uh, gzip compression. More importantly, we could uh, you know, get the total content size down considerably given the processing power that we had. These are these were fairly powerful processes. So as I would strongly suggest that if there's one tweak that you want to make to an Nginx configuration, it is increase the gzip level, add gzip to begin with, and increase the default gzip level that you find. Now, you can find more documentation about this at say the Nginx wiki, which will detail step by step what exactly is going on in each configuration. But I would not suggest that if you're looking for performance optimization that you start from here. Where you really want to start off is more a place like the HTML5 boilerplate. Just do a search for HTML5 boilerplate and you'll get a site that gives you a, a starting point for most web applications. And one aspect of this web application, which is available at h5bp.github.io, are a set of server configuration files. They'll give you the Nginx configuration file, Apache configuration file, Node.js configuration file, etc. That does all the stuff that I talked about and a hundred things more based on a lot of experimentation. So you really want to use that as your starting point. The other part, so first, We've gzipped the content. Now, question is, can we reduce the amount of content itself, right? Um, we only have one image. It's an SVG file, which we can then color dynamically. Uh, unfortunately, it's a 3MB SVG file to start with, and that's what we had generated. So, 
can we get that size down now if it were a raster image a png or a jpeg or whatever i would just toss it into kraken.io which i find has the best compression online right now and i would be very happy to be contacted if someone finds me to a better site uh, so i would have taken a raster image and just dumped it in here and it will give me anywhere from 90% to 50% compression and used it but what do i use to compress an svg file so let's dive in into the contents of the SVG files. So this is what it looks like. It has a series of paths. Each path says this is the coordinate of one particular point. Draw a line here, draw a line here, blah, 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 blah. Uh, and you'll notice that it specifies this to more than 10 decimal places. I don't need that kind of accuracy. On the screen, at best, if I specify it with maybe uh, two digits, three digits, max four digits, it should be fine. Right. Question is, how do I go about compressing this rounding off the numbers? SVG doesn't have any default tools. Good part is tools like Inkscape will support that. So when you do a file save as in Inkscape, there is a drop down that asks you what kind of file you want. In case you're not able to see it from the web, don't worry, I'm not able to see it from here either. But there is a drop down out here that says optimized SVG, which allows you to set the precision, which is effectively the number of decimal places that you want to round it off. So firstly, always save as optimized SVG. I can see why you would not. And set the number of decimals to what you think is appropriate. So I set it to 2. And this is what I got. Nah, 2 is not good enough. But the great part is the file size is extremely small. It came to 95 kilobytes all the way from 3 MB. So that's at least we're going in the right direction. Then let's take 3 decimals. So this looks reasonable. And at 145 kilobytes, and this is not before GZ. So at this point, it starts looking reasonable. So I said, maybe this is okay, but if you zoom in, this is what you get. It's still pixelated. Now, I don't expect people to zoom in when they're looking at election results, but there are a few people who do. Right? <laughs> so, four decimal places. At this point, we are up to 613 kilobytes uncompressed, which when compressed comes to about 100 odd kilobytes. And given that this is going to be a sent only once, we took a call that we probably want to go for this level of quality rather than going back to the previous level. Now we could have, based on the bandwidth, picked the right kind of resolution to serve and all of that. We did not have time. This happened at approximately 4.30 a.m. So Now this has a pretty decent uh, resolution. When you zoom in, it looks kind of okay. So that was one aspect of content compression. In other words, start with the biggest thing, make it smaller, and then go for the next biggest thing, make it smaller, and so on. This was our biggest thing. The uh, next part of it, and beyond that, the rest of the content was pretty small. It, uh, the second largest piece of uh, content that we had included was the data itself. So we had to compress the data and I'll come to that in a bit beyond that the rest was pretty small. Uh, so which brings us to how do we go about optimizing the rendering? See, there are so many filters out there that what you want is whenever each of these filters is clicked, you want the response to be generated dynamically, almost instantly. You don't want the user to have to wait. Now, the round trip time is huge. The amount of time that it takes to generate need not be large but the round trip time will be at the very least about 100 milliseconds. It's very tough to avoid that. And that produces a lag. Click on it. It's a little laggy. And on a mobile device, that's going to be one second, five seconds, whatever. Can we, on the other hand, make sure that these filters are all on the client side, meaning I do not even need to go to the server to generate this. This is a paradigm which is different from where complex content is generated on the server, what you do is send data to the client and let the client do all of the rendering. That's a completely different paradigm. And what I'm going to do is walk you through some elements of options that you have in here and how we applied it. Now, firstly, how does one go about generating client content using data? Uh, well, if you look at just how content is written today, we either do it in a declarative way, which is like HTML, you just type the content as is, or in a procedural way where you generate the content using a programming language. You can take JavaScript, put a long string in it, and display it. So those are two paradigms by which you can generate content. Now, if you want to take data and apply that to generating content, there are a couple of ways. One is templates, create a long string, or bindings. You say, I want this particular data element to be the width of this element. I want this particular data element to be the color of this element, and so on. You take various columns and map those columns to attributes of the data. And that's effectively what does binding for you. Now, on the client side, I have only one option, JavaScript. So I've got to go for that. But from a combination of these perspectives, declarative versus procedural, templates versus bindings, what are the options that I have? Well, all four combinations are possible. And here are popular li libraries that sort of represent 
the uh, way in which this programming this kind of programming is done uh, you can see i'm going to show you some code which you can see at the repository that i've listed below i will at some point today after lunch or before lunch tweet these repositories and the location of this presentation but what we're going to do is create a simple bar chart out of all of these the bar chart takes 10 numbers 0 to 9 and draws bars in orange out of these that's that's it let's start with underscore what underscore does is lets you define a template just like in html except that inside the template you can use the equivalence of server side includes you can effectively write javascript code put a for loop out there and as you loop through all of the numbers from 1 to 10 that's out here for var i is equal to 0 i is in 10 i plus plus you put in a div with a width that is computed so in other words you're embedding javascript into html and then there is an underscore dot template function which takes the stuff converts it to html effectively evaluating all of the javascript directly on the client side and renders it that's one paradigm Let's take the procedural way of doing the same thing, which you would in jQuery. Now, out here, we loop through the variables 1 to 10 and take the chart element, append a string which is dynamically constructed. The width of the string is constructed using JavaScript and you say the width is i times 20. So, doing the same thing except not as part of the HTML but as part of the JavaScript. But still constructing the string and dumping it out there. Both these are template based approaches. You also have the option of bindings. Knockout is a pretty good example of how bindings work. What you do is say, I'm going to have a bar. Firstly, you say that I'm going to have a bar chart in which I bind this to a data set called numbers. Numbers are an array from 0 to 9. And then within this, within this for each, you loop through, create a bar in which you bind the style setting the width to the number times 20. Now, out here, you're not quite creating the HTML. You're letting uh, knockout do that what you're saying is I have this attribute this attribute maps to this function this attribute maps to this function the function could just be take the data from a column or any set the other approach is d3 where you do the same thing not in the HTML but you do, do this in JavaScript in d3 you say I want to uh, create a bunch of divs based on this data which is the range of 0 to 10 which is effectively 0 and all the numbers from 0 to 9 set the attribute of class to bar set the style to a function which is the number times 20 and be done with it all four options are possible now i had to weigh in the relative pros and cons of each of these there were two factors that were concerning me one the size of these libraries d3 is huge 143 kilobytes underscore is six kilobytes and there's just no question of which one wins in knockout and jquery are in between uh, the good part was i already had jquery i had a dependency on jquery in any case so by default i would have gone for jquery but there's one other problem which is that i also want a certain amount of animation what i want is for these to move dynamically i want as as, as i click on a filter i want the progress bars to gently slide which if i were connected to the net i would have shown but i'm going to skip that uh, so because of this we had to pick something that was dynamic we finally went in for underscore but today, if I were to go back and relook at this choice, uh, sorry, what we did was went in for underscore and used an alternate version of knockout that we created ourselves, a very small library that permits animations. Today, if I were to go back, I'd probably have chosen knockout or D3 if I could afford the buffer, but at that point, we could not. <laughs> so we have client side rendering, and this is optimized from a responsiveness perspective. There's, I'm not reducing the amount of data. I'm just making it feel faster because what I'm doing is sending all the data out there and the client can just completely disconnect from the internet and still play around with it. Which means that they're slight, going to be slightly less worried about when the result is going to be coming in next. They're at least slightly going to be busy playing around with these filters and that's going to occupy their attention. All of these gimmicks you try and use to distract users, right? It comes in handy. <laughs> but we did have to optimize the data and what the data looked like is this. Another one and a half megabytes of data every second which is how often it's refreshed. So there's no way I'm going to send one and a half megabytes of data through the pipeline. Apart from the fact that it's going to be a lot of bandwidth for the client, uh, we were paying for the bandwidth on the server. So, pretty expensive. <coughs> but some of it is static. See, the constituency names are not going to change. Further, this is also repeated, but we'll come to that in a bit. So, some of it is redundant. I don't need Pedapalli repeated 50 times, one for each candidate. If it were Modokuruji, it would have been repeated a thousand times. 
we don't need that we just need some identifier that tells us that this is a constituency and the worst part is some of it is misspelled or just plain wrong now that wrong comes in two parts um, to begin with we thought that this last column out there titled winner is going to be the one that tells us whether the person's won or not and we did this week there was a session where we were actually testing out whether we got a number of candidates right or not nielsen sent a feed over a span of four hours for us to test and we found that every single one of these numbers were wrong the winner is just not updated real time what they do is update the number of votes as rapidly as they can and then a few hours later they come back and try and fill out the wins helpful good to have known that beforehand thankfully we did a dry run so we knew that so the way you calculate the winner actually you don't calculate the winner you cannot find out whether a person's won or not okay you pretty much cannot what you can do is say that the candidate is leading and you don't really know when the election has been called until firstly dca calls it and then nielsen decides to take that data and put it in here so you would have seen at least on dca and ibm and a bunch of other sites that they would have made the assumption that a candidate who is leading has won that's pretty much it if you've gone you know at, at any point you only show the leading candidates and the undeclared candidates you don't bother showing whether they won or not and that's in the heat of the moment that's accurate enough the selection didn't even matter but we definitely had to take care of the other kind of problems which is the thing uh, which were things like misspellings uh, etc so for example at the bottom the state courts were different between nielsen and the election commission so you start mapping some of those um, the other part was how much data do we really pick from the server there were all kinds of columns what i showed you earlier was a subset the 1.5 mb is a subset there were several more columns out there that were created by various people to help them tag whether this particular party belongs to this particular alliance whether well, this candidate belongs to a certain alliance even if a party belongs to an alliance there isn't a necessity that a candidate necessarily always belongs to that alliance under a few circumstances uh, <laughs> so uh, all of those tags were there we didn't really need that now the thing was when we reduced the number of items that were queried instead of querying select star we just said select what we need from this database that improved the querying time dramatically remember we have to get these queries up and running extremely rapidly we have less than a second to run these and we constantly want to run it every second so every millisecond and microsecond counts the other thing was to start normalizing all of the static data we need a list of candidates and when we have this list of candidates you can send this the list of candidates one time and then if the list of candidates is ordered in a predefined way the next thing that you need to send is the only the following information how many votes did they get in other words if there were 8000 candidates then i send an array which contains all of the candidate information which party they belong to which constituency they are contesting in all of the stuff and then the next time i only send the number of votes in an array of 8000 characters effectively partitioning the data into what is updated versus what is static and we start we created a candidate file therefore which had all of the static data it just said in this particular constituency you have this particular candidate who who stands for who is in this particular party and whether he's winning or trailing but the dynamic file looked like this where we had some redundant data uh, which we put in because mobile devices don't really like to compute a lot of stuff so we put in a certain amount of pre calculated stuff that could have been calculated on the client but the rest of it the bulk of the information was simply how many votes did each candidate get as of a certain point in time and that is what constantly gets streamed in now you'll notice here that the choice that we made is json as opposed to csv file csv or a bunch of other things that you could send over the web um why is that well firstly let's take csv versus json in terms of file size csv is smaller no doubt about that but when you gzip it you'll find there's no difference what gzipping does is takes all of the common stuff and knocks it out and what json does is constantly repeats the column names so these two roughly cancel each other out so the overhead of gzip is negligible when you say so overhead overhead of json is negligible when you gzip it so that wasn't a consideration and json's flexible i can have hierarchical structures which i cannot have in csv so in vast majority of cases i normally go for csv in this particular case it was a no brainer it had to be json and each of these ended up being a 27k gzip json file in other words that's all i need to send down from 1.5 megabytes that's all i need to send for a person to know who exactly is one at any point in time which definitely helped so all of this was set up by around 6:30 and we were there ready waiting for the 5 million people to come in and it was pretty tense <clears throat> in the first 1 hour we hit about half of the 0.6 million so if the election were to go on for 6 hours then already we are at Uh, sorry the first half uh yeah 
we would get to easily 3 million and through the day it looked like we were going to get to the target of 5 million very easily. By which time tweets started rolling in and these were mostly good uh, things like probably the best done website for tracking elections, uh, Grammar seems to be the company running the elections, must watch link blah 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 and finally so Bing's done a much better job than Google at the election results. This ended up being a big theme almost every uh, visualization or every tweet that mentioned uh, the Bing website and the Google website seemed to be in favor of the Bing website because this was being relayed to them and Microsoft team is completely thrilled, is completely thrilled. Uh, an hour later, uh, sorry, yeah, but in the first hour we had a couple of hitches. The first was we have an admin page in our server and the admin page lets a person log in, gives them various roles, etc. We deployed this at uh, 6.45 or so, not much sleep and we forgot to set a password for the admin page. Which is not a good idea, usually. Despite this big warning out there that says no administrative roles defined, we just went ahead and some nice chap in Ahmedabad found this. So he spent a good 10 minutes playing around with this and uh, tweaking it, trying to see what would happen, <laughs> and ended up shutting everyone out. So at around 8.40, we found that the site was not accessible and it said 401 not authorized. Panic, I don't know. We didn't really care what was happening or what was going to happen. Just kill the login, restart the server, get it there, go first to this, set a password, move on. Total downtime of approximately one and a half minutes, which most people did not notice because of the Nginx caching setting that we had set. We said that if the file is not, if the proxy server is not available, just take it from the cache and send it. We counted the number of uh, errors that were not authorized that were served. It was less than, it affected less than 100 people and we were lucky that we were one of those 100 people. <laughs> So, a uh, message to uh, the Ahmedabad chap who's uh, done this, if you're seeing this video, please contact gramna.com, we want to recruit you. <laughs> um, <laughs> the other thing that happened was at around 8.55, our server was at, uh, was getting close to about 65% utilization. At this point, we were worried, seriously worried, because uh, this is a s relatively small server. We had planned for load balancing and all that, but in the heat of the moment and all of these changes, we did not turn on the traffic manager, we did not turn on the backup server, and there was one machine slightly less capable than my laptop running this visualization. And there wasn't an option to turn it on at that point. 8.55 we started praying, and it was really worrisome. Uh, 1.3 million visits the next hour. At this point, the server ought to have crashed. The one thing that saved us was the fact that Mr. Modi won decisively. The election was called, the interest in the elections gently started coming down. So it was downhill after 9.30. If it were not, and, and this is probably the weirdest reason that anyone's thanking the BJP and the NDA for, thank heavens. <laughs> Otherwise our server would have crashed. The tweets were uh, consistently positive. Uh, thanks Bing for Bing.com slash elections is the first time I'm more active on Bing than Google for once Bing beat Google. Check out this awesome data visualization, Bing India election graphics are superb, etc. And we hit not 5 million but 10 million on that day. That was how that day went. This was a team that created the visualizations and <clears throat> without doubt one of the most memorable days that we ever had. And the lesson that I took away from this was that firstly, you don't really need large, you don't need big infrastructure to handle big data. You can get away with a machine that's smaller than my laptop if you're lucky enough and hopefully follow a bunch of fairly good principles. First principle is to test, test, test. Data is often wrong. Data is often incorrectly transformed. Data is often verbose. Data is often misstructured. You don't necessarily need to structure it the way it's given to you. And all of these are assumptions that you assume that what you get is right and correctly structured and so on. All of these are assumptions that are worth questioning. Lastly, remember that no matter how far you think you've optimized, someone can always beat you at it. Just remember that. Do not stop until you literally run out of time because there's always more optimization to go for and there is no such thing as perfectly optimized piece of content. Thank you and I'll take questions. Okay, so we're going to open it up to questions right now. If you have a question, please raise your hand and then we'll have somebody bring you over a microphone.
my question is um, um why don't you use a content delivery network uh, because uh, you know your users are geographically dispersed a lot of diaspora is there who's interested in your content and uh, if you just host it at one place and i think it's at singapore uh, the round trip time you know from across different continents would be fairly high absolutely so we set up a content distribution network uh, which would serve traffic out of the us as well as out of singapore uh, this was from azure traffic manager we split the load across two servers in uh, the us and two servers in uh, singapore and the plan was that all of these would get served at 6:45 in the morning we forgot to turn it on which is why i'm saying we got lucky so the yeah, short answer is yes absolutely you would next question here yeah. so i'm not it's proprietary or not so what's the backend technology did you use uh, the grana visualization server is the application server the rest of it is non proprietary so if i can find the slide that shows the architecture uh, that chunk on the right side that says grana visualization server that's proprietary the rest is not meaning all of the all of the code that i showed you is not and it's on github that repository that i sent i will be committing the nginx configuration file there as well and you can always do a view source far better it is in javascript not even compressed we can need to jzip was good enough may not even minify jzip was good enough okay next question raise your hand up high next question We have about another five more minutes for uh, question and answer, so keep the questions coming. Yeah, I thought I've got some stuff to show you. Uh, firstly, thank you, Great Talk. Uh, you said when you look back, you use D3 or Knockout. What? Why? Uh, it provides uh, better animations. The uh, point is, uh, when you're rendering on the client side, you have to decide whether I want to take the HTML, scrap what I have, redraw it, or just take the attributes and modify it. The advantage with uh, with modifying attributes is that if let's say I change the top uh, style element, now it will move from the top to the bottom in a jerky way, to whatever position I want. But if I add a WebKit transition, transition, mouse transition, effectively all the CSS transition attributes, it will move smoothly, which looks nice to begin with. Now, not just that, with many of these frameworks, I can actually start using JavaScript to animate it where CSS is not provided. So that's uh, that adds a bit of jing bang to the whole thing, which some people seem to like. question uh, regarding knockout versus uh, angular uh, angular comes with animations the support that we have for css transitions these days is pretty good this is rendered on svg in any case i'm knocking off ie8 and below because they can't render svg the vast majority of the browsers today that can render svg also support css transitions so which means that if i change the attribute i don't have to worry about how exactly it's going to get transitioned so therefore that differentiation between knockout and angular is slowly vanishing in a, in the sense that it uses javascript animations on the other hand knockout is small so over time it will not uh, yeah, people would probably gravitate towards knockout for this particular aspect and by no means saying that angular is worse or better hey, Anand. Hi, Anand. So, the question i have is uh, why wasn't there a load balancing server we forgot and Oh, you forgot about that, or that's not available on Azure? No. no. Uh, so, firstly, uh, was there a load balancing server? Yes, that was Nginx. It turns out that there was only one server that we used, which was also a load balancing server via Nginx, and uh, that had that sent that balance the load across four different systems. What we did not do was balance the load across multiple servers, for which we had planned and tested using Azure's Traffic Manager, which is their internal load balancer, and it worked beautifully. But we just uh, that is their equivalent of the elastic load balancer. I that is correct. Yeah. Traffic manager is what it's called. And, and and what what did you what uh, uh, framework did you use to create the gram? Python on the server side, JavaScript on the client side. Okay. Right. Okay. Don't have the question. The the framework that we used to create the gram visualization server. Okay. Hi. Uh, yeah. Yeah. This side up. So this is Mahesh. Uh, so I see there is data and there is rendering on the client side. Yeah. So what is that visualization server doing in between? Uh, firstly, there are a bunch of other visualizations. Secondly, what it's doing is uh, acting like a server side template. It is what co takes the data from the database, converts it into the JSON files. Number one. Number two. That's what stitches together the arguments that come in from the URL and renders the appropriate uh, version of the visualization that comes in. 
and it also uh, stitches together the list of filters uh, you may have you may remember seeing a list of filters on the right side we didn't want to send a static list of filters up front it is quite dynamic so what we do is on the server side generate the list of filters in other words what's happening is there is a database which contains raw data and there are a set of files that get sent to the client which include html css javascript json all of these are being created by the granular visualizations the transformation is entirely happening there using a templating mechanism so there is nothing custom you need to do to render a visualization for elections so the visualization server has all the abstractions to help you do all this that is correct uh i would do i wouldn't say though that it has all of the abstractions we did have to customize on the visualization server a reasonable bit for this election context but yes it has the underlying layer for us to be able to easily build what it takes to render that out thank you you may speak hello sorry uh it's about spatial data Uh, it looks like we have pretty decent data with respect to Lok Sabha constituencies, assembly constituencies. Um, so you were able to use it. What about other like census data? Where were you using this? Of course, on the last day, maybe not. But prior to that, when CNN and IBN was putting out their telecast, were they trying to use literacy rates, populations, normalizing data? You pulling up census data where you needed to map census. codes with the uh, lok sabha constituencies okay so uh, this actually the map that uh, you see on the side did not actually exist before we created it and this was using the painful process of taking a pdf file zooming in tracing the regions and coming out with it took a few months to get it done and the only reason we actually went forward and finished it was because we were being paid enough otherwise it just doesn't work out so to be fair now on data meet there is uh, an open source version of the election commission maps for those of you who may not be aware data meet is the mailing list a uh, group of people in india that are very enthusiastic about data there are a lot of mapping discussions that go on so uh, it did not exist we created it and there are ongoing efforts on data meet which may be very aware of to create these census maps specifically to the question of whether cnn or ibn or any of the other media companies are using it uh, no uh, by and large no certainly not as an organization a few interested and enthusiastic people in these organizations are playing around with these uh, agnash selesting of times is a big good example uh, but by and large in the media side the amount of time and effort that it takes today to create something that is map based is huge india today for instance is doing a piece of work which has made that infrastructure much simpler for states but not further down uh, it will take time for us to get there the infrastructure in the open source community to uh, for mapping is a whole lot better interestingly we are getting as much support from outside india as we are getting from the open source community in india and of course no support whatsoever from the authorities such as did touch upon that Earlier, so mapping is unfortunately, from a government perspective, a slightly closed network. If we wanted census map today, unfortunately, pretty much the only way is to try and take the various bits and pieces of it that have been crowdsourced, or put together a massive commercial effort to create those maps. But but what about the mapping between census codes and spatial boundaries? It has been attempted. Uh, I. Do not know of any reliable attempts. So, so uh, I know of one mapping effort. The exact URL escapes me, uh, which takes at least a list of census codes and parliament codes, as it were, and parliament constituencies, and says this particular parliamentary constituency is made up of seven percent of this uh, of this ward, so eight percent of this ward, etc. It is approximate because the underlying maps are approximate. Yes, that I know of at least one such effort that exists. Given reasonably accurate maps, that can be automated. Uh, it has not, to my knowledge, yes. The mapping between census and constituency is has not been done, and it's not been done. Yeah, it has been difficult. Yes. Hey, uh, uh, Venkat. Okay, unfortunately, that is all the time that we have for questions right now. If you have more questions, once again, sb.lk/hasgeek. Um, you can ask any other questions right there. I know that you guys have many, many more on your minds. Please take the discussion there. If you see him outside, ask more questions. Then, um, everybody, give a big round of applause. That was a fantastic discussion right there.